David Parhalo, thank you very much for taking this time to, um, to share your experiences of your service in Vietnam with us. And uh, let's just start at the beginning. Um, how did you get into the Army and when did you get into the Army? I, uh, uh, my parents moved here uh, when I was in high school to Florida and I uh, started at the University of Florida, which is a land grant college like Tommy Bailey that you talked to. So you had to take two years of ROTC. And when I was signing up for my courses, uh, the uh, counselor said, uh, do you want Army or Air Force? That was all that was offered. And uh, not having uh, a big background in the military, I said, what's, what's the difference? And he said, well, in the Army, you get to fire a rifle, 22 rifle. So it's, I said, okay, sign me up for the Army. And it's funny how little things in life can, can change directions for you, you know, and lead you down a path. Yeah. And uh, so I uh, finished two years uh, of school. and. Uh, a friend of my dad's who uh, said, you know, this thing in Vietnam, this is 1964, I started in 62, so in 64, he said, yeah. this thing in Vietnam is not going to go away. Uh, your son ought to take the advanced program when he graduates and get a commission. And uh, I got a whole $28 a day for, or $28 a month for being in the advanced program. So I graduated and uh, the, my senior year, actually, I was, uh, went back to the ROTC building and they had a notice that if you want to take this test, I think that Tommy Bailey and everybody else took for flying, uh, they, you could get your uh, private pilot's license courtesy of the military. And I said, that sounds like a good deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I graduated, I had a, a BS, a uh, commission and a private pilot's license. Um, I was in medical service corps because I was a pre-vet student. And uh, at Florida at the time, really the only place you could go for vet school was Auburn, Alabama, because they would take 16 vet students and Auburn would send 16 pharmacy students to Florida on an exchange program. Oh, wow. but there, okay. there were 92 people applying. And uh, so I, I did not get accepted. But having said that, uh, and with my career, I'm, uh, I have no problems in not going to vet school. You know, in other words, I think that the path that I was led down or that I fortunately went down uh, is fine. I wouldn't change it for anything, which, uh, yeah. That was that was the, uh, one of the trainers they had there. That's the helo that you trained on. Trained, yeah. The the the, the primary training, uh, the first four months was in that, and the second four months was at Fort Rucker, Alabama. In the well, in the Huey, we had a, a short session of instrument training in a yeah. uh, H thirteen, which had same kind of bubble, but it was just a made by uh, uh, made by Bell instead of uh, uh, Hiller that made the H uh, yeah. twenty. When did you actually arrive in Vietnam? Uh, May of 68, uh, the 19th of May of, ni of uh, 1968. And uh, I, I arrived in Cameron Bay, which is north of Saigon in that area. Yeah. And uh, I know you've asked uh, some of these guys what your first impression was. Well, yeah. getting off the plane, my first impression was it was hot and humid. Mm. Uh, I didn't have smell any uh, obnoxious smell, but maybe that just was for the city down there was a lot of people, I don't know. But uh, from there, they sent our orders down to Long Bin and uh, they came back uh, within about eight hours, I guess. And I was assigned to the uh, 498 Medical Company. Yeah. And so uh, I went, uh, went up there. Um, for what it's worth, um, I, uh, I didn't, uh, well, when I was a senior in college, I knew that I was uh, going to be flying. I knew that I'd be going to active duty and I uh, figured I'd probably be going to Vietnam. And I, uh, not knowing a whole lot about war and hearing all the news, you know, you think that everybody goes over there gets killed. So I was kind of uh, felt like uh, that might happen to me and I might be coming home in a body bag. So I didn't get anything started, uh, any, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, significant relationships with women because uh, I'd seen guys that uh, had done that, got married, maybe their wife had a child. Wow. They went to Vietnam and they got killed. And then uh, uh, here's a young woman with a child and uh, $20,000 GI life insurance policy, no. and that's about it. But the uh, point I'm bringing up is, is that I guess that made me a little faster and looser than some of the guys because I didn't, I figured, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So I, I was probably more at ease, if you want to, uh, if you understand. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so I got there and uh, quick uh, story. I uh, arrived at the company area at Lane Field and I'm walking up to the headquarters, and of course they can tell I'm a new guy coming in. Yeah. And uh, 
there's a warrant officer there who is uh, just getting ready to leave. And of course, he said, oh, my replacement's here, I can go now. And that was you know, kind of the thing uh, he felt like he had put in his year and he could leave. And after talking to him, I realized that this guy had a year's experience, okay, and knew the techniques, knew the area, I mean, all that stuff. He's leaving and I'm coming in and I, yeah, I, I can fly, but that's about all I, I can do. And I said, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, mm. And it's great to rotate every 12 months like we, we did. You know, you spend 12 months, you go home. Uh, but, uh, you know, during the Second World War, uh, everybody went in for the duration. And when the war was over, you came home. And the war was over when you physically broke the back of the civilians, uh, if you will, in the government in Germany and in Japan. Okay. And, of course, uh, we didn't really do that. We played this kind of game in Vietnam, which was unfortunate. But uh, you, you, I mean, you're, you're raising the, the theme. There are a number of things you said that I'd like to ask about. Um, but you just there raised the, the theme of the, uh, of the difference. As you said, you go to World War II, you're in it for the duration. You go to Vietnam, if you're Army, you're there for a year. If you're a Marine, you're there for 13 months. And, of course, some people extend, but, but most people don't. And there are differences of opinion about that. You know, the, the one year, the one year in country rotation. Um, it sounds like, like your view of that is that on the whole, that probably wasn't, wasn't a good idea. Is that, is that kind of where you stand on that question? Well, I, th I think so. And um, I think uh, a lot of people might say that the war was micromanaged from Washington, DC. Yeah. Uh, with the best and the brightest as they called them back then. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think that was the case. And, uh, uh, it's probably unfortunate uh, because, uh, well, let me give you an example. We were talking about the uh, Koreans, okay? Uh, we supported the Korean Tiger Division and made Korean pickups and all that. Well, there was a place called Miami Beach, which was south of Quinyan, and it was where the Korean uh, new recruits would come in. They'd train there for about two or three weeks, and then they'd go up to the Tiger Division and be part of that, okay? So it's like an in-country training. And uh, myself and uh, Bill Cruz went down there, and we had a helicopter station there for, I don't know, maybe a month or so. Uh, and we weren't really all that busy, but uh, one day a captain, a Korean captain, came by and said they were going to go out on a patrol uh, tomorrow just to let us know when we're approximately where they're going. And I said, how long are you going to be gone? And he says, until we get two prisoners. And I said, well, that's the incentive program, right? If you want to, yeah. if you want to get something done, say you want to come home early, get two prisoners. Okay. Yeah. The whole point I'm getting at is, is that if you have an objective and you, you uh, have a goal and you go out there and achieve it, yeah. then maybe you can, you know, finish up what you're doing. Uh, and for my money, uh, I think it's been said before, the Koreans. If we'd have hired the Koreans to fight that war, it probably would have been over about six months uh, because uh, yeah. they had the mentality of the. Uh, uh, of the North Vietnamese and all that, and they just yeah. didn't take the answer. And uh, yeah, but you know, we didn't. So yeah, are, are so are you are you suggesting? I mean, just, I think it's just basic psychology. I, I think what I'm hearing is, if if the objective is to get home, then okay, the World War II model is I get home when we win. The Vietnam model is I get home if I can just stay alive for 12 months. Exactly. You know. And so the emphasis, now you don't want to overstate it because you hear plenty of guys say, you know, I'll ask them what, what was the war about? And they won't say for me, it wasn't about communism, it was about me surviving and helping the guy next to me to survive. But, but it sounds like you're suggesting there is that kind of inevitable, you know, day checking, you know, just checking off the days, which, yeah. you know, that's a different objective from winning the war. Is that kind of what you're... Well, and one of the, you know, one of the things that happened there, um, from time to time, we uh, would get together. Um, I, I spent a lot of my time at these field sites, Elsa English, Uplift, and all that, away from the company area. But sometimes we get in the company area, and we might have a little party or something, you know, at our, at our little uh, lounge or something up, upstairs, uh, or even sometimes with the nurses from the hospital. And somebody would yell out, short, which meant that they were short in time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, somebody say shorter, and so people were counting the days, and then yeah. you were over there for 12 months, which was 365 days. So once you hit 99 days, you became a double-digit midget, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> which meant you were 
that you were down to double digits left, and right. so you were considered a midget. But anyway, because you uh, and it rhymed. But no, you're right. I think, and uh, for good or ill, you know, you look at some of the statistics, and some people were killed just days before they were supposed to rotate back to the states. I know it's yeah. Tough. That always gets uh, especially tragic. But uh, no, it's it's uh, I don't know. I think that uh, one of the things about uh, flying dust off was that the mission was all important. You got a a call from somebody that uh, needed to be picked up, wounded, whatever. And you got the mission sheet and the crew ran to the helicopter, cranked it up, took off. And our mission was to get out there, make the pickup as quickly as possible, get that patient back to an aid station or hospital, whatever was appropriate, as quickly as possible because time was of the essence. And so the mission, maybe for Vietnam, should have been uh, uh, bring the North Vietnamese to their knees, okay? Uh, and uh, so where you devastate the, not only the military, but the uh, civilian population, they say, I give up. Um, now, mm. I don't know what you've heard, but uh, supposedly in the recent years or not too many years after the war ended and they had the peace treaty, so-called peace treaty, uh, the North Vietnamese said after Tet that they were devastated and the, and the Viet Cong. Now, in the process, they killed a lot of civilians, okay, and but yet they were defeated handily. And they said that had we pursued them and really gone after them with full force, then that might have ended things. Maybe it wouldn't have it, but that's what they say. You just mentioned the, the Tet Offensive, and you said that you got into Vietnam in May of 68. Right. Tet, of course, takes place at the end of January 68, and then the months that follow, that's, I mean, when you arrive in Vietnam, you're right in the middle of, in terms of body count, in terms of American casualties, the toughest part of the war. Also, yeah. early 68, you've got the rioting in you know many riots in many cities. You've got the assassination of Martin Luther King. You've got President Johnson, who looks like he's giving up because he declines to run again. Now, you're, you're, you're training while all this is going on. To what extent at that time were you paying attention to all of this. You know, I mean, because people look back at 1968 and they said, wow, I mean, it seemed like the world was coming unglued in 1968. Were, were you too busy training at the time really to notice or were you absorbing that stuff as well as you were training and getting ready to go to Vietnam? No, I didn't uh, absorb much or, or uh, get too involved in the political situation or the riots and all that stuff and the anti-war protest. I mean, we knew it was going on, but again, our job was to get the mission complete and then work with each other, take care of each other. And uh, really the dust off crews in the 498th anyway, were worked as a team. And we talked about the aircraft commander pilot and the crew chief and the medic, but we did, we worked as a team. We knew what each of us had to do. And, you know, we, yeah. uh, and a lot of good techniques were developed. And so we we're uh, more interested in flying, staying alive, obviously, but, uh, yeah, so you focused on that. So, um, so it's it's always interesting to you know to read the textbook accounts and then to talk to veterans. The the textbook mm -hmm. account is you know this is part of the Cold War and it's a fight against communism, which it was. But then you talk to the guys on the ground, as you just said, you know there was my particular mission and my particular unit. When when you're flying. When you're in the air on the way to Cameron Bay, um, you haven't met any of the, or you, you know, you haven't joined the unit yet. You haven't been to Quinan yet. Um, you don't have any knowledge of, you know, any firsthand knowledge yet of what it's like to work with the Korean forces to deal with the Viet Cong, the NVA. All of that's still an abstraction. You haven't gotten there yet. You haven't landed in Cameron Bay yet. At, at that time, what did the war mean to you? Well. Um I think it was a situation where um, we felt like, uh, of course, I essentially volunteered and I had a job to do, and that's what generations before me had done. Uh, and uh, I was just going to do whatever it took, you know, to, to uh, uh, do the right thing, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and, and learn, because uh, initially, as a pilot, you're basically tuning radios and reading maps and stuff like that. 
and uh, the aircraft commander might let you fly depending on what's going on. And then learning how to make approaches uh, and uh, in flight school, they're just standard approaches to start and go down a nice slope and land and all that stuff. But over there, you want to get down from about 1,500, 2,000 feet, which is out of small arms fire range. We'd come down as quickly as possible with spiral and then head towards the pickup point uh, as fast as we could. And then the uh, helicopter wasn't made for this, but you would uh, be streamlined headed forward and then you'd kick it into a side flare. In other words, the side of the aircraft would uh, start creating all this drag and you'd slow down quickly and then put it down on the ground. Uh, and they bring the casualties and the crew chief and the medic would hop out and you know, you'd uh, uh, get them in. Uh, and then they, in the back, they'd say clear right, clear left and we'd take off and yeah. you'd take off and get as much airspeed as you could, uh, as fast as you could. And then uh, as soon as you got to about 60, 70 knots, you pull back on that center stick, uh, the cyclic, and you would turn your forward speed into, into altitude, into climbing. And so you get up as fast as you could. So you're going fast and up like that. Uh, and uh, so you're learning techniques uh, on how to do all that stuff. Yeah. You know? So you're, so it, it sounds like, you know, the answer to the question, you know, what does the war mean to you even as you're flying into Cameron Bay? and you know, you're gonna set foot in Vietnam for the first time. What the war means to you then is, I've got a job to do and, and I need to do it well. And that's, yeah. that's what it is. Were you with the 498th um, the, the, the whole time, your whole year in, in Vietnam? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, when I got there, um, there was a command structure that was there. And then a month later, Colonel Scott and Retzlaff arrived with their pick of the platoon leaders. Uh, so I got a little taste of the old guard and, and then, of course, the taste of uh, Retzlaff and Scott for the, the rest of the year. But uh, about halfway through my tour, Colonel Scott asked me, I was back at the company area, he said, would you be interested in going to Saigon and being a liaison officer from the 44th Med uh, representing the, the dust-off units? And I said, well, what, what would I do? And he said, well, you, you, you're in an office, you'd be doing reports and maybe giving some briefings. And uh, then at night you would... Uh, go out and maybe have some, something to eat and then uh, end up uh, going drinking or something. And I said, well, I would much rather stay right here with the unit. I felt an obligation and, uh, you know, it's like uh, people that were wounded and went back uh, to finish out their tour because they felt like it was their obligation to the unit to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Part of the, your contract, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So you wanted to stay with the 498th. You didn't want the... Relative, now, relative I, luxury of Saigon. I think that sort of thing might have helped if somebody was going to make a career of the military because you'd probably go down and bump elbows with some colonels and generals or something. I don't know. And that, you know, all that would probably help your career. But yeah. I was a reservist. I thought I was, you know, going to go in, and, which I did for three years and then get out and, uh, you know, do my duty, so to speak. Yeah. So you were saying that you arrived in, in Vietnam, you arrived, uh, or you were working with the 498th about a month before uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott showed up to, to take command. Um, how was that different? That, you know, how did, how did the unit change? How did the spirit of the unit change, if at all? What was different uh, between that first month and then the rest of your tour when uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott was in command? Well, I, I, I know that uh, I was there about a week, and then they sent me up to LZ English, where I spent a lot of my time and started learning really how to fly in Vietnam. So I didn't know the uh, command structure that well. And uh, by the time I got back, Colonel Scott had already come in. The other people had already left. So uh, the only impression I got was is that the uh, uh, command structure before Colonel Scott got there was fairly lax. And I know that... Uh, Hoist missions were very important uh, if you couldn't land and you had to have a workable hoist in the aircraft, and we didn't have a lot of them. And uh, uh, Scott and Restlaff were looking behind some those metal Connex boxes, you know, that they, they ship things in, and there was a whole bunch of hoists laying there, I guess, in the sand or in the uh, weeds. So they picked them up, took them down, and got them repaired and serviced so we could put them in the aircraft. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know that... Uh, you know, maybe the previous commander structure was uh, not quite as on top of things, I guess, as uh, Scott Retzlaff. And, and Colonel Scott, you know, he uh, uh, called us in and said, uh, you're flying single ship missions. 
uh, you're going to run into some people that might want to pull rank on you, uh, you know, a major or somebody, because we were mainly lieutenants and some captains. And he said, if you have any problem, call me. He says, I, I'm a colonel. I can talk to a colonel. And uh, so uh, I, I never had a problem like that. I know a, a friend of mine did. But um, anyway, so, and, and like people say, if any of our aircraft were in trouble or crews were in trouble, the first aircraft off at Lane had Scott and Retzlaff in it. And they were coming to find out what was going on, to help out, to, to do whatever uh, was necessary. And, and these, uh, these are the, 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 the two commanders, Lieutenant Colonel Scott and Reslev. What was Reslev's rank at the time? He was a major. Major. Major, yes. So it sounds like you're confirming what I've heard from a number of, of other uh, veterans who served with the 498th. Because by now, I've talked with hundreds of, of Vietnam veterans. Um, but what really strikes me is I, as I talk to, to vets of the 498th who were there when you were there, right? they, they speak of this unit as having um, a strong sense of identity, a, a strong, uh, you know, high morale relative to other units. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, given the situation of being in a war zone and dealing with so much horrible stuff, that's the context. But within that context, an experience that was about as positive as it could be in that context. That's, that's the impression I have. Is that, is that right? Does that describe the 498th? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, you know, you've, you, you're involved in your career and you've been different places and met different people. There, there aren't many true leaders out there in the world. There are a lot of administrators from my perspective that are supposed to be in leadership positions, yes. but real leaders, you, you can tell. Now these two guys, and the platoon leaders were real leaders in, in my estimation. And that made it a whole lot better. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's, uh, I, as I got back to the States and I had, uh, I was assigned to Fort Rucker and all that, you know, I, I met a lot of uh, commanders and people that, you know, officers. And some of them were only in it for uh, their own glorification or they wanted to get promoted and so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and that's too bad because, uh, and I, and I want to give all the credit in the world to the ground pounders, the uh, infantry, the rangers, stuff, Marines, the people on the ground, because that was really tough. And I, uh, we were, we experienced situations where we were shot at, we lost crew members, you know, it was a dangerous job, but the, the guys on the ground, you know, that was, uh, that was really tough. And I mm. uh, give them a lot of credit because that, and that, that could probably cause more, maybe more problems. I don't know than being in an aviation unit, but you know, it's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. So you were saying a minute ago, you know, kind of speaking of the leadership in the 498th, and you said something that I, I identify with very much because I've had the same thought many times. You get a lot of people who are in leadership positions uh, because they have done things that have gotten them into leadership positions, but they're not actually leaders. They're, they're managers, uh, they're administrators, but they're not leaders. But then you have others who are who may be in those kinds of positions, but in addition to having those administrative roles, they actually are leaders as well. What in your mind, you know, drawing on your experience from the 498, um, what, what in your mind are the characteristics that set the true leader apart from the person who has the leadership title, but who may actually not be much of a leader? What's, what are some of the characteristic differences? Well, I think the biggest one is, is that a leader will do whatever he asks you to do, he or she asks you to do, uh, without hesitation. And I think they also understand that there are limits to everybody's ability and the common sense has to work into it too, where, uh, you know, uh, they can tell you to take that hill. Well, they know that 90% uh, of the people are going to get killed taking that hill. That's stupid. But a true leader might say, all right, we, we have this mission. We have to take this hill. How can we do it? And let's do it uh, differently and let's minimize the casualties. Uh, so it, it's really uh, a matter of will they, are they willing to do what they want you to do? And will they stand toe to toe with you uh, in the face of adversity too? Uh, I think that's it. And again, Colonel Scott saying that uh, he thought we were excellent pilots. We were well-trained and that we had a job to do and uh, he would back us up 100%. Uh, and knowing that, of course, uh, made you feel better. And then knowing that uh, 
they were monitoring everything that was going on because in the northern part of South Vietnam, we had one frequency like 911, you know, so, and we did, and a lot of units would change their call frequency from month to month or whatever to try to show the enemy off so they wouldn't be able to monitor the lines. But dust off had to be one frequency. So when somebody needed us, they didn't have to thumb through a book and find out what the current frequency is. They just right. called, they knew, had memorized the dust off frequency and they'd call it in to a, a, a operations area and uh, a dust off would come out. Yeah. So um, th that's it. I think just common sense uh, and a willingness to do whatever yeah. they requested their troops to do. Sure. And when you, and when you say that, um, if one of your helos is shut down in the course of a mission, then the first helo out there is going to be, um, is it sign six? Is that right? If I do I have that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Scott or, or major Reslaff uh, are going to be out there. So now I was enlisted. I was peacetime Navy enlisted. And one of the stories I heard that, you know, impressed me is that Lieutenant Colonel Scott, um, would sometimes go around, you know, the enlisted guys are standing guard on the perimeter. And sometimes he'd go out and just hang out and talk with them. And I was reflecting on that. I mean, you know, nowadays, now I'm in my early 50s now, and I have conversations with O4s and O5s, you know, fairly regularly. But when I myself, when I was an E3 and a junior enlisted guy, E3, E4, it never would have occurred to me that anybody above 03 would ever have the slightest thing to say to me, you know, let alone take any interest at all in what I was doing. Um, so I was, I was, I was impressed by that. I just, I, so here I'm just kind of making a comment. I don't know if you, if you have a response to that, but even the thought of an 05, you know, climbing up, climbing the ladder up into a guard tower to spend time with an E4, that's, that's pretty impressive. I, I never saw any such thing in my, my four years in the Navy. Well, I think that that uh, reflects on the fact that he was in charge of the whole company, not just the pilots, but everybody enlisted. And if you're on guard duty or, uh, or if you're in the mess hall or, you know, wherever, you know, he'd probably go around and talk to people and uh, let them know that he knew of them and knew that their job was important. And, uh, that uh, he would be there too for them if uh, if they needed something or there was a problem. So uh, uh, no, the um, and, and the Navy. I don't know. Um, I think the Navy is different than the Army in many ways. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick little story. Um, uh, da Nang, which is north on the coast, right. uh, was a big naval base, right? And uh, when in July, I think it was a. Uh, detachment up there had a lot of high time on their pilots and aircraft. They needed some relief. We flew two aircraft up there, and I was just uh, still a pilot, but we uh, used their aircraft, and of course, they would use their, their aircraft commanders, and I was a pilot. And I, we went out one time up for a pickup. We were there about two weeks, but we went out one time on a pickup, came back in the middle of the day, and we shut down, and, and this uh, uh, aircraft commander said, uh, you want to eat at the Navy mess hall? And I said, yeah, why not? I don't know. So we walk over and of course, most of the coast of Vietnam is big, wide, sandy beaches. So it's hot and it's dusty, okay? Yeah. We come to this building, no windows, right? Big, heavy doors you open up, go inside, and then uh, a uh, enlisted Navy person walks up and says, two for lunch? Yes. It's got air conditioned <laughs> building. It's got piped in music. And right. this is 1968, right? So we walk in and sit down. It's got linen tablecloths, snapped in the silverware. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we give our order, and he says, help yourself to the salad bar. Now, I don't remember when salad bars became common, but, uh, you know, I don't think I really knew of salad bars as such before that. So we go over and have some salad. We eat, and we had to sign for it. And so we walk out, shut the door, and I said, hold it. Wait, wait. We, we just went through the twilight zone. I said, we just got transported back to the States. I've yeah. told some uh, Navy people about that, especially some uh, admirals, you know, like, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, the second level 08, is it? Yeah, 08, I guess. Yeah. Said, well, it's not always like that. I was going to say, well, I'll bet it is more frequent than you think. Yeah. And of course, you guys yeah. <laughs> didn't get that. Mm. Well, that, but, that, that raises another question, and I do want to ask some questions specifically about your work with the 498th. 
but that that does raise the question um you know let's let's talk about this enlisted guy who met you at the at the door and um you know who's i guess escorts you to the table and tells you to go enjoy the salad buffet now if he's around today you know he he and i don't mean this in any way in any demeaning way just as a statement of reality he he can be walking around with a vietnam veteran hat you know um and you of course you've got a lot of guys in the rear echelon who are doing important work you know your work can't be done if if the if the folks in the rear echelon aren't doing their work yeah. but you know you do have a lot of guys who served in vietnam who never got close to combat um when you meet those vets those vietnam vets um do you feel do, do, is there a distinction in your mind kind of between you know the guys like there were in the 498th and then those who who did important work but not in but in non-combat roles in the rear echelon is, is there any distinction in your mind i i don't think so i think what they did was they served okay they had boots on the ground all right and uh, a lot of people didn't serve or tried to get out of the military or went to Canada, you know what I mean? Uh, but they served and they did what they could. Now, uh, places got mortared, okay, uh, without notice. Uh, some, you know, safe compounds could have gotten overrun. And uh, even the, what we call the clerk typists, you know, that were doing cutting orders and doing all the rest of the stuff, something could have happened to them. Uh, you know, it, it could have been a, situation where uh satchel well i know uh right after i got there uh some vietnamese or nva probably uh, or, or uh, Viet Cong came into an ammo or not an ammo but a, a fuel depot that had some big tanks with satchel charges <coughs> and they blew up some of those tanks we picked up a black guy who had burns and of course you find out real quick with that skin pigments only, you know, that, that thin. And uh, we had to take him back to uh, uh, the hospital, which was fairly close, and he probably ended up at Recovery Medical Center in San Antonio, Fort Sam, because that was a big burn center. So yeah. what was he doing? Well, he was there, but he was, you know, working around a uh, fuel depot, and uh, hopefully he survived. But, uh, you know, was his job important? Yes. Uh, could, could he have gotten killed? Yes, and maybe some people did. I don't know. So... No matter where you were, uh, it, uh, something could have happened. Some jobs may have been safer than others, but sure. uh, I, I don't see any distinction uh, myself. I, I'm just glad they served. We talked about where they were stationed, what they did, and uh, yeah. so it's, uh, uh, yeah. I don't have a problem. You, you just mentioned the, the, the Viet Cong, and, you know, um, in your work at the 498th, you know, doing medevac dust off, you know, you're, you're having to deal with, both NVA and Viet Cong. I wanted to ask you about something I read just this morning. I was reading a report, uh, Army report written in 1967 on, um, you know, Viet Cong tunnels. And, and so this report's about, you know, how to find the tunnels and how to, how to get into them. But, but, but the VC, the Viet Cong were described as lazy and not very good soldiers which I, I thought was strange because the report talked about how elaborate some of these tunnels would be, how well hidden they were and all that. Um, but the VC in this report written in 1967 described as lazy and not very good soldiers. What, what, when you think about the enemy, and here we're focusing specifically on the Viet Cong, um, how would you, I mean, does that description fit your thinking that the Viet Cong were lazy and not very good at, at what they did? What, what's your own reaction to that? I, I don't really think so. Uh, I think that uh, they were, uh, well, I, I sent you that picture of LZ English in the fire support base with the, the Vietnamese that were there. With and, the South Vietnamese, right? The Arvin guys? South, yeah, and the question always was, were they on our side during the day and somebody else's side at night? You know, because yeah. you, you never knew. Uh, yeah. But uh, one thing that uh, the last six months I was there, we picked up more booby trap victims than we did gunshot wounds, okay? And guys with arms or legs blown off because they uh, hit a booby trap, the IEDs of today, except the ones today are more sophisticated, I guess. Yeah. So who was out there setting those traps? I don't think it was the NBA. I think it was probably the Viet Cong. And they, they told us about uh, these traps where they'd have you fall into a pit and they had bungee sticks, you know, the, 
like uh, bamboo sharpened all that. So they, they were certainly doing something. And uh, yeah. shortly after I arrived too, I was up at English and we were flying. I can't remember the reason for the mission, but it was at night and it was clear night. So it was not too bad. But we came back in, and as we got close to the perimeter of LZ English, we started to let down. Well, uh, probably 50, 100, 200 yards from the perimeter, we heard this thump. And uh, the aircraft commander said, everybody okay back there? Well, the crew chief said, I'm okay. We didn't hear anything from the medic. Uh, we came in and landed, which only took you know a few seconds. And uh, Specialist Lum, uh, the medic, had been shot. Somebody had shot at the helicopter. And the, the round went uh, through the floor, up right between his front and back chicken plate, right through his heart, and he was killed. Uh, so, you know, it, that was probably uh, a Viet Cong out there rolling around trying to take some shots, and, and it was just maybe one shot Charlie, but that's all it took to kill an American. Charles Lum, wow. Uh, nice guy, good medic and all that, but uh, so, uh, and, and that, that's kind of the situation, you never knew where you were, or what was going to happen. I mean, if you uh, if you're going into a place where uh, the, the the unit was under fire, had been under fire, you might expect to get uh, shot at all that stuff. And if it was during the day, you know that was at least you could see where you're going. But um, you never knew uh, when something might happen. Uh, it's uh, yeah. So what you're getting at, I mean, you know, in in response to this quote, where this I believe he was a major who wrote this report, described the VC as lazy and not very good soldiers. It may be that they're not very good soldiers in that in a face-to-face -face fight with American forces, they're almost certainly gonna lose, but they don't seem very lazy and they do seem pretty industrious and pretty clever, right? Given their poverty, how, being in such an impoverished situation relative to the Americans, how can they make it work? And you're describing some of that, the traps and the, the pot shots and things like this. Yeah, I I think they 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 did their job. I mean, uh, I think a lot of the uh, before I went over there, um, one of the majors that turned out to be a platoon leader at 498 made a couple comments. He said because we were trying to find out what was going on, what's it like, and all that. And his comment was, "You never get Charlie out of the jungle. It's kind of like guerrilla warfare. It's almost impossible to get." Out. And then uh, uh, on top of that, uh, what was he said? Uh, uh, um, all the people want to do, most of the people in Vietnam, citizens want to plant rice, have babies, and worship Buddha, okay? Now, there's always some that want to get rid of Americans or, or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll, and they're maybe fanatics, whatever, they, you know, they just, so they're, they're, they were probably involved in Viet Cong at night and yeah. a lot of this stuff. So, you know, as, as I'm listening to you and, I, and I'm thinking about a photo you sent, which we'll edit into the video, I'm thinking of this contrast that, that comes up a lot. So we're hearing about the, v, the VC, the Viet Cong, very industrious and all this. And then you've got this photo that you sent me of these uh, Arvin forces, these South Vietnamese army forces. And the caption that you add to it is friends by day maybe something else at night you never knew. And there's this, con there's this contrast of the VC, crafty, persevering, kind of relentless, willing to absorb tremendous punishment. And then the Arvin, the general perception I get is pretty much what you wrote in the, in the caption. Um, could you say a little bit more when you reflect on, and I've, I've, I've interviewed, you know, in Vietnam, actually in Way, in near Nha Trang, you know, uh, I, I've interviewed, you know, Arvin veterans, one of whom lost a leg uh, in the war. He actually stepped on a, on a VC mine, I think, and he lost a leg during the war. So it's interesting to, to talk to them. Um, but what, what was your sense of our South Vietnamese allies? You know, you've said a little bit about our Korean allies, our South Korean allies, you said a little bit about the VC. What was your sense of, of our South Vietnamese allies, the Arvin forces? Um, I, I don't think that they were uh, as strong, uh, uh, strongly motivated as soldiers. But uh, going back, of course, the French were there before we were, right? Yeah. And they, the uh, Ho Chi Minh defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu. 
And maybe some of these Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, they got maybe not a great education, but they, they knew some of history. And maybe they thought, well, the French were here and they left. Maybe the Americans are going to be here for a while and they'll leave. So why should we, uh, why should we risk our lives or whatever uh, when the Americans might, might pull out, and which we did? Uh, and so maybe that was in the back of their mind too, you know. Yeah. Um, they, they, that country, I guess, even before the French just had the Siam, they had all their problems. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's hard to say. Um, well, and there, there is something to that because, you know, these Arvin veterans I've spoke with, they, they did have to spend time in, in re-education camps after the war and they faced discrimination and, and, and so on. What, what toll did that take on you and the others you were with in the 498th when you had this feeling that you had an ally that you, you, you weren't sure you, sure you could depend on? I mean, did, did it really matter day to day? Or what, what toll did that, did that take, feeling like you have an ally that you're not really sure you can depend on? You know, uh, the, uh, we had Arvin advisors, American Arvin advisors that, that that were part of the platoons and companies of the, the, the uh, South Vietnamese soldiers. Yeah. So I felt that uh, the, the two or three that I knew, I felt they were probably going to be very good guides and instructors and trying to motivate, you know, the, the South Vietnamese. But our, our day-to-day activities, we would get uh, uh, involved in missions and stuff, and you focused on that. So a lot of what you did was focusing on your job and, uh, I, uh, at Elsie English, they had a, uh, uh, a Vietnamese barber, okay, with a barber chair and all that. And uh, he used the old hand clippers, if you remember those, you know, head squeezed together. Yeah. And uh, he, he, I don't know, he cut your hair and do a pretty good job cheap. But then he always wanted to crack your neck afterwards, which, which can feel good. But I always wondered, I said, what if he goes a little too far? <laughs> and... Uh, yeah. uh, but it uh, never happened, so I, I made it back. But it, it, you always uh, kind of wondered sometimes about who, where the loyalties were uh, when you had face-to-face oh. Well, I, I, where I thought you were going with this, because I've heard twice now about guys who are barbers on base by day and VC by night, and it turned out, you know, they ended up, you know, being taken out in a firefight or something. You, you mentioned fo- being focused on your job. You told us about this one mission you're on where – Probably a VC takes a pot shot and gets a, and unfortunately, uh, Charles Lam is uh, the medic is 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 killed as a result of that. Do you do you have any idea how many missions in your year there with the 498? Do you have any rough idea of how many missions you actually you flew? Uh, a, yes, you know what? Um, I've got the I've got the plaque in there, and I didn't, should have brought it in. Uh, I know there was uh, 1199 patients carried wow and uh i don't know i think uh, uh i think there was about well each mission probably lasted about 15 to 20 minutes uh i can get that plaque because they one of the nice things too was they when you got to the unit they said we need five dollars said for what well when you leave you're going to get a plaque and it's going to have the company uh insignia and also uh the number of hours flown uh, uh patients carried and uh, whatever, you know, a few, few statistics on there that you can take back with you. But uh, yeah. I don't, I can't remember the exact number of missions, but um, uh, again, and of course the number of patients depended on a lot of things. Sometimes there were single patients, sometimes it was a group, yeah. uh, sometimes at Holland, but I can, uh, maybe I can find that out before we, before well, we quit. The, the, you mentioned uh, 1,099 patients that you're directly involved in, in getting off the, off, off the battlefield. Does that thought ever go through your head that even as we speak, some of these guys are walking around and maybe very late in their careers or, you know, retired, um, and they're walking around thanks in part to, to you and to the, the crew you served with on, on those helos? I, I think so. I mean, and uh, there were very few casualties we picked up that did not make it to the hospital or the aid station. You know, just one or two that I can think of. So, and, and I'm happy for that, but again, if everybody does their job, no matter what the job is, and try to do it to the best of their ability, that's what it's all about, and that's, that's what we did. Um, so well, it's, uh, 
uh, and I, I know I, I have on the back of my uh, car, I have a, a license plate holder that says Vietnam veteran dust off pilot. And then uh, I got some awards anyway. I've got some stickers on the back and all that. And one day I was going over to our daughter's house about a mile from here and this car was following me. And I said, oh, I wonder what this is all about. So I pulled into the parking lot and he pulls in behind me and he got and said, um, say, I see you're a dust off pilot. He said, yeah. I said, thank you because I got it back uh, by a dust off. And uh, I thought that was very nice. You know, I wasn't sure what, what his motive was, but he just wanted to thank me that, uh, that I was a dust off pilot because he, he had gotten dusted off, as they say, in uh, Vietnam. Well, I wanted to, that, that's, that was my next question. I mean, what, yeah. have you had other responses? You know, I don't know, you know, if you see another vet in the store with the Vietnam vet hat on, I don't know if, if it's your habit to, 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 to talk to them, but have you had other responses from combat vets when they found out you were a dust off pilot? Yeah, I was in the hardware the other day and I saw a guy that had a, uh, a Vietnam uh, hat on. I asked him, you know, where he's from and all the stuff. And I mentioned to him that I, I was in Quinn Yan. I flew uh, for the 498, but I flew dust off helicopters. And uh, he said, oh, really? And so he pays and he goes out. He gets out in the park a lot. And he stops and comes back and he said, you flew dust off? And I said, yeah. And he said, wow. He said, man, that was, that was a tough job. And so he kind of understood the uh, what, what we went through, but he, it was, and he was thanking me for it, obviously, but uh, yeah. it, uh, he, in passing, he didn't catch it quite uh, right away, but then he thought about it and he came back in and, you know, and, and said that uh, uh, it was uh, what we did were, meant, meant something. So that was, uh, I, yeah. I get a little emotional sometimes when I'm talking about this stuff too, especially about <clears throat> the guys that I worked with, you know, because we were so close, but anyway. Uh, Wow. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's rewarding. While I was there, we got shot at, uh, and, again, we lost a crew member, and uh, there were times when uh, we thought we'd uh, another medic had been hit, and he was just a superficial wound and all that. But uh, the Huey is, is a great aircraft, and uh, it's very forgiving, uh, just like we make those approaches to kick it into the side fire that puts tremendous stress on them on the frame, okay, but uh, that's the way it allowed us to get in and out, and uh, it, uh, it's thin skin, but, you know, it, there's a lot of places they can shoot holes that don't hit something like uh, like the engine or the hydraulic system or, you know, or tail rotor or something like that, right. so it's, uh, uh, it, it holds up well, I mean, it held up well, and they're, they're, they're good aircraft, yeah. um, but, uh, I, you know, um, in one comment, uh, everybody sees war movies and it's always shoot them up and everybody shooting each other, you know, and bullets are flying off stuff. Well, yeah. that didn't happen uh, all that often, although it, it could have, but uh, we flew at night, uh, especially in bad weather. I mean, dust off, to my knowledge, was the only aircraft that flew low level, you know, like one to 2,000 feet above the ground at night. Now, I've heard stories of uh, Navy, Air Force jockeys that would uh, fly from oh, maybe Hawaii or Japan and fly across Vietnam at night at 35,000 feet, and they could say that they were in a combat zone, so they got combat pay, <laughs> which, which happens. But yeah. anyway, when we would take off at night, we'd turn off our rotating beacon, which was to let everybody know where we were, and our running lights along the side, and we'd turn down the instrument panel lights because they would reflect off the windshield, which meant that uh, we weren't going to run into any other aircraft because there's none of them out there. But uh, it was hard for... Uh, the bad guys to see where we were. You could hear the, hear the Huey, but it was hard to, to determine exactly where it was coming from, you know, the direction because of the sound. Yeah. But uh, flying at night in bad weather to me was, uh, was worse than uh, to make pickups than it was to uh, go out during the day and maybe think you might get shot at because uh, we were in the Central Highlands and, you know, you had mountains and all that stuff and, uh, yeah. uh, and possibly getting vertigo, which one, one aircraft did. And, in the process, it lost uh, two crew members because wow. it crashed uh, with vertigo, wow. and, uh, and that can happen a lot at night. So. So you've got you've, you've got hundreds, you know, several hundred missions, and I'm sure that a lot of that just kind of blends together and becomes sort of a, a memory blob. You know, I mean, I, I doubt that you remember every single specific mission, no. but 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 there must be there must be some that that 
have been burned into your memory. Um, would you be willing to talk about one or two of those, you know, specific missions that you really do remember in, in some detail? Yeah, and one of, one of them was uh, when you come into country, you're a pilot and you're tuning radios, you're learning. And then as people rotate out of the unit back to the States, uh, they give you a check ride, and now you're the aircraft commander. Well, before you're the aircraft commander, you're not responsible for much of anything. Mm. You become the aircraft commander. You are responsible for the four souls on board that ship and then anybody you pick up. So I got get checked out during the day as an aircraft commander. I get the orders, and I'm flying during the day. We have a couple of pickups. That night, we get a call from the Koreans, and they're in this infamous Phuket Mountains that are close by us. In these Phuket Mountains, and some of these pictures you see uh, in the Orient, you'll see kind of mountains kind of popping up out of flat areas and popping up here. And that's what a lot of the Phuket Mountains were like. So we head out to make the pickup. I had not been to that location during the day, okay? So I didn't really know what it was like. And uh, with the Koreans, we didn't have an interpreter at that time. So the language barrier was, uh, was tough. We got to the place and we made a circle around and I told the crew, I said, I haven't been here during the day, but this is the way we're gonna go in. So keep an eye out for, this was at night, it wasn't bad weather, which was nice, but uh, keep an eye out for boulders and just things that might hit the tail rotor or the main rotor. Uh, and so we come in and just before we get to the ground, we turn on our landing light, which is normal. Uh, and all I see is these shadows of these boulders and stuff off to the, to the right, I'm going, oh. And we land, okay, and we uh, get down there. They put the patient on board, and I told the crew, I said, we came in like this, you know, a general approach because you have to at night. I said, the only way I know to get out of here safely is the way we got in. So we picked the helicopter up, and the beauty of the helicopter is we backed it out, the tail first, mm. all the way back up that string, if you will, till we got some altitude, turned around, took the patient to the Korean compound. So I guess what I'm saying, too, is, is that, you mature in a hurry, okay, when you have that response, but I, I think so. Uh, and uh, so the experience of Vietnam is uh, you learn discipline, uh, you get responsibility, you uh, mature in a hurry because uh, you're dependent on other people, other people depend upon you. And, and, and that was one of them that was uh, significant. Uh, because you, because I, that, that's when you remember feeling that burden of responsibility falling on your shoulders. Oh, yeah. Because I, I hadn't been to that LZ. I didn't know what that was going to look like. I've got these people on board. I've got to make a decision about how to go in and then how to get back out. And so uh, the guy upstairs was looking after me, and uh, we got in okay, and we got out okay. So divine providence, I believe, plays a big role in uh, our lives uh, in many situations. So. I'm sorry, you said providence? Divine providence. Yeah, divine providence. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. But uh, and and there was no, one other that I'll never forget. Uh, the the French were there before we were. Right. So obviously there was a lot of uh, intermingling, and there was French Vietnamese. You could, I think they spent a lot of time in the city. I never saw a lot of them out where we were, but uh, they were, tend to be taller. And many of the uh, you know French and Vietnamese women, uh, the French men. Are, had you know had beautiful offspring. I mean, they're attractive, uh, yeah. handsome men. Uh, and the Vietnamese officers uh, were able to travel with their wives. I guess if they had wives, I, I think that was part of the policy. We picked up a Vietnamese, a French Vietnamese officer, young guy, uh, booby trap victim again. Both legs blown off, right? Mm -hmm. And he's on the stretcher, and his wife gets on, and she's in this white outfit, and she's really very attractive. Okay. And I felt sorry for her because here's her husband, you know, that uh, it looked like they hadn't been married a long time. Both legs blown off. He's going to have to have prosthetics or, you know, be crippled, whatever. And we're flying along. And I said, what is that smell? Because we always flew with the doors open. There's a lot of wind. When you die, often you're, uh, you lose control of your sphincter muscles. Uh, but this guy defecated all over the uh, uh, litter, okay? And I thought to myself, talk about insult to injury. Not only did she have to be with him, he's got both legs blown off. Uh, and then, of course, he defecates and the smell is terrible. But that, that was just an indication that he had died. And we got him to the Arban Hospital, and they had a different hospital than we did. And 
when you would come to an American hospital or an aid station, of course you'd call in, of course we called into the Harvard hospital, but somebody would come running out, they'd get the stretchers, they'd take them in, put them wherever they needed to, take care of them right away. Oftentimes we'd drop off Vietnamese at the hospital on the pad and nobody would come out. Mm-hmm. And of course we dropped off this guy and his wife and uh, we had to leave of course and nobody came out to see him. Now, was there animosity uh, towards the French Vietnamese uh, offspring uh, as opposed to the straight Vietnamese offspring? Maybe so, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the feeling I got when we dropped this guy off uh, that nobody you know, uh, was out there to try to take him in or take the, the woman in. Nobody so, uh, with him. That's tough. Wow. Um, what did the what did the wife do? I mean, what was what was her? Was she just well, kind of I, I, talk or what was her response to all this? She didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. She just very stoic. And uh, uh, again, um, I, I don't know her background or his background or anything, but I I think I had somebody told me that Vietnamese officers could take their wives in certain situations. Yeah, I've heard that. And, yeah. So, uh, but, uh, and you know, for what it's worth too, the culture of the Vietnamese and the culture of the Americans were so different, you know, and uh, for us to think that we can uh, Americanize or uh, change a culture of a, of a people, especially something like that, uh, is silly. Uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, there's too much, too much difference. Yeah. I hear that. Have you been to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C.? Yes, I have. How did, how, yeah. how did that go for you? Well, it was tough. Um, a friend of mine I was in flight school with, who was a great guy, was going to get married when he came back. He got assigned to the 1st Air Cavalry. And uh, the day before Thanksgiving, uh, they were flying into a hole up in the northern part of uh, South Vietnam picked up some American GIs, took off, got hit with a B-40 rocket, the whole thing blew up. And his wife, his wife, his uh, fiance, Jane, sent me a letter saying that uh, it was hard to put her feelings into words, but the day before Thanksgiving, Steve Beals was his name, his parents had been notified he'd been missing in action, and the day after Thanksgiving, they were notified his body was being sent home. And Steve and I ran around together. Uh, he was a cool guy, had a cool car. And when we were in flight school, we ran around and did things together. And so that was, uh, uh, that was tough. So when I got to the wall, of course, I wanted to see where he was listed. And also Lum, and there was a guy named uh, Chris Lucci. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, a guy named uh, Granville that was uh, in our unit that was killed, a uh, crew chief. Granville? But what, what, I, what I thought was, I said, these names are not big enough, they should be bigger, and they should be etched deeper uh, into that granite so that a thousand years from now, people can walk by and see that. Because, I mean, mm. uh, I just felt that it was, uh, I, I thought it was an excellent memorial, but uh, I just wanted the names to be bigger and jump out at people and, and, uh, mm. and also etch deeper so that they, they'd last for many, many, many years. Has your experience well, here's, here's an experience that, um, that a number of vets have had, and so I wonder if it corresponds with yours. And that is they come home and they kind of want to put the war behind them. Uh, they, they don't talk about it much. They try not to think about it much. But then they move through life and they get, you know, um, near retirement, post-retirement, and then they find that, that then their mind is going back to it more and more and more. Um, is that how it's been for you? Uh, what, what, you know, what's it been like? We're talking about 50 years, more than 50 years now. Um, was that what it was like for you? Kind of just put it away, not think about it, and come back to it later in life? Or how did it, how did it work for you? Well, I think, uh, yeah, you put it away uh, because, again, you don't know what kind of reaction you're going to get from people uh, mm-hmm. at that time as being a veteran or being in the war. And uh, it's... Uh, I, I even had a, well, I received a Distinguished Flying Cross Award uh, when I was there, and I had a lapel pin, okay? And I'd often wear that, but most of the time people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say anything, and sometimes people would ask, what is that for? And I'd tell them, and of course, they, it's hard for them to relate, okay, unless they've been in the military, but uh, 
you, you, you didn't say a whole lot or do a whole lot, uh, but uh, it was uh, a, a, a guy that was in my unit. Uh, uh, his name is Gerald Miller. Real, real easy. Uh, he was a pilot, and we actually flew not together, but out of the same LZ sometime. He came back to Atlanta, and we hooked up again. And actually, there was a reserve unit at Dobbins Air Force Base that transferred from a transportation detachment to a medevac detachment, and they needed MOS qualified pilots. So we went up there for about five or six years. We flew, which was fine. You know, we got to continue to fly. But I, I was able to talk to him, and of course, he was a, a veteran that was in the same unit. So. Uh, I guess I had somebody around, but uh, mm -hmm. then uh, all of a sudden it became fashionable to wear fatigues, uh, you know, it was a fashion statement, and then people were thankful for these guys, the volunteers, and I am too, that uh, protect us, okay? And so you kind of came out of your shell, and just like putting a sticker on the back of your car or something like that, saying Vietnam, Vietnam, and all stuff, you felt more comfortable doing that than you would. What do you think... What do you think young people today should know about about the Vietnam War? Suppose I put you in front of my class for a couple of minutes, you know, and and you know, and you're free to say whatever you want. Um, what what do you think young people today should know about that conflict in Vietnam? We, uh, as a nation, at least our political leaders, thought that it was in the best interest of this nation to try to stop communism and that form of government. Uh, from taking over that area of the country or the world and maybe spreading. And uh, there's always bad guys out there uh, in every country, everywhere, okay, that want to take over, rule, do somebody harm, whatever. So we're probably always going to have these, these type conflicts. And I think uh, the, the younger generation needs to be aware of it. Uh, I want to tell you my quick philosophy and uh, uh, I wouldn't trade the time I spent on active duty for anything, okay, the military. Uh, but I tell people when I'm king, <laughs> so I don't have to answer to anybody. Yeah. Every, everybody, every male and female that turns 18 or graduates from high school should spend at least two years in the military. Uh, it would have a leveling effect on society. People from all ranks would come together, and uh, a guy from uh, uh, Podunk, Iowa might the next sit next to the uh, bunk next to the guy that's the next CEO of Coca-Cola. Uh, and so you would build a relationship there. You go through basic training and it would give everybody a common thing to bitch about because bitching is, is a part of a soldier's right. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you can always complain about that. But to me, what it would do for many people, it would give, teach them some discipline, which I'm not sure a lot of them have. Mm -hmm. It would give them some responsibility, which a lot of them don't have. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, you built, built some camaraderie, but I would have one year of that two or three year stint spent in a foreign country. And I'm not talking about France or, or, uh, or uh, Germany or something like that, someplace where uh, it's not really very nice and people can see exactly what the rest of the world is like. When they came back and they got off the plane, they'd kiss the ground and say, this is a wonderful country. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I want to make it better. Yeah. I don't think they realize that. No, I think you're, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100% about that. Yeah. I agree with you. I think some sort of service, you know, military or, or some comparable service is important. And I, I've had a similar thought. I, I've often thought when I look at my students, when I think about my students, I mean, I've been to, for example, Guatemala about 25 times. and I just think, gosh, you know, if you if you kids could go see other places in the world, you'd realize that the stuff you're complaining about right now really isn't that important. Yeah. Um, speaking of the responsibility, how old were you when you were flying dust off in Vietnam? 24, 23, 24, something like that? I was 23 when I arrived in country, and then, of course, I had a birthday and was 24 yeah. when I left. When, when you see 23-year-olds these days, does it amaze you the level of responsibility you had as a 23-year-old in Vietnam? Well, yeah. You know, the, the aircraft at the time was worth, cost three hundred fifty to 400000 Now it's probably three to $4 million. I don't know if you can uh, make a Huey. Uh, so not only did you 
fly that aircraft, uh, which was a lot of fun to fly in many cases. It was fast and almost like your own Corvette, but it flew. Uh, but then you had uh, souls on board and you had a responsibility and a job to do. So, you know, um, uh, we were at a wedding in Atlanta a few years back and we sat at a table with a couple and the husband worked for a company where they had projects and deadlines, okay? And he, we talked about military and he said, I was a, you know, a dust off pilot. He said, that reminded him, he said, the group that he was with, they would have projects and deadlines. And as it approached the deadline, a lot of them would just be running around crazy, you know, got to get this done, got to just really upset. One guy was always kind of cool, calm and collected. And he asked him one time, he said, why is it everybody else is going crazy at the deadline and you're just so calm? He said, after you've flown helicopters in Vietnam, nothing bothers you. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. That would be uh, a tremendous asset for anybody. Because I know my wife, you were down here in Florida, and uh, if there's thunderstorms or something, and she's out someplace, she says, oh, you, got, you got the kids, you're going to get them in the bathroom. You're gonna... I said, settle down, settle down. <laughs> we're okay, don't worry about, it. you know, the, they, what do they say? Don't sweat the small stuff because it's all small stuff. Yeah. But I think when you've been through an experience like that, not everybody comes out that way. I mean, there are people that have trauma and post-traumatic stress. So, you know, it's, it's not always that way. But in many respects, you realize what's important, what's not important. Yeah. And uh, that would go a long way to, I think, changing some young people's lives. But anyway. No, I, I agree with you. Well, David Parhala, I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to share these memories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. And uh, I thank you for doing what you, the project that you're doing.